welcome Don Flayton. Okay, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and um, even though I'm retired, I'm enjoying the opportunity to do a few special projects with uh, friends, and uh, also if they're fun, and, th and Ag Days is fun, so this is, this is something I look forward to. I'm going to talk a little bit about optimizing pea fertilization too, sort of a similar topic to what Edgar covered, but I'm also going to talk about long-term fertility management as well. If we take a look at, uh oh, uh, the, the issue of pea fertility management, I'm going to try to cover in an hour today what we've written over several hundred pages in a review that's available uh, online through the Fertilizer Canada website. And the lead author for this review was Dr. Cindy Grant, no stranger to this crowd, because she was an Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada research scientist at the Brandon Research Centre for many years. She's recently retired, and uh, she helped put together the sort of the literature background that I'm, I'm going to refer to some of that today. With respect to what I've seen over my career here in Manitoba the last 35 years or so, some things are the same in terms of fertility management, especially phosphorus, we still have cold soils in the spring, short growing season, uh, most of our soils have a high pH, and there's snowmelt runoff as our main environmental concern. But there's also some things that have changed over this period, more transition towards reduced tillage, higher yields of our crops because of varieties and management practices, and more diversified rotations, lots of different crops being grown. So if we take a look at yield trends, over the, my, my career, I've seen yields more than double. Here's hard red spring wheat it yields in Manitoba, more than doubled in the last uh, 40, 50 years. And if we take a look at our cropping sequence, there's more diversity in that cropping sequence. We're still limited in many cases by the amount of phosphate fertilizer we can apply because of seed row toxicity issues. And if we have canola, corn, or peas or soybeans in the rotation, those are crops that are very sensitive to seed row pea, and they have high rates of removal. You can see that the pea balance here, and on, on the very right-hand column, is strongly negative. A deficit of phosphorus for every year that we're growing those crops with typical fertilizer rates. So this means that over a rotation of four years, if you've got these crops in two out of four years and you're maximizing your pea and your cereals, you're still seeing a deficit in your phosphorus fertility balance and gradually your soil test phosphorus and soil test pea fertility will be declining. We've also got a challenge of very dynamic prices, not only for commodities like wheat that we grow, but also for fertilizer. And this means that we have a high risk situation financially. Edgar referred to this uh, in his presentation. Lots of variability in prices for both what we grow and what we have to pay for inputs. And this is causing concern. Here was last weekend's article from the Manitoba Cooperator talking about how crop revenue has drastically declined and in fact declined greater than the crop input prices have declined creating what is a, a definitely a concerning situation for uh, crop producers. So what we're promoting now, of course, more than ever, is the 4R nutrient management strategy where we encourage agronomists and farmers to be paying attention to the right rate, source, time, and placement of fertilizer. But I just sort of have one added element that I want to talk about today, and that's what I call the EC formulation, which isn't emulsifiable concentrate, like in some herbicides. This is the extra careful formulation for the way that we're managing our fertilizers because we have to be prepared for much thinner margins than what we've seen probably in the last couple of years. So when we take a look at phosphorus, fertility, and nutrition, it's important to recognize that phosphorus is an absolutely essential element for all forms of life. It's the element that joins the chains of DNA together. There's no form of life that we know of that doesn't use phosphorus. So you've got to watch your phosphorus fertility if you want to grow anything. It's held quite strongly in most soils, especially if their pHs are high or low. The optimum pH for phosphorus availability is between 6 and 7. 
And a lot of our soils are more than seven, of course. It's taken up by the plant in the orthophosphate form. You've heard this probably in marketing campaigns for different types of fertilizers. The orthophosphate form, like in 12510, for example, is the form that's most easily taken up by plants. It is one phosphate atom per molecule, and that's what the membrane of the plant root is, is, is suited to pick, to pick up. Uh, uh, do I have to, okay, there we go. Moves, it moves the roots primarily by diffusion, which is a short distance process, less than a millimeter of distance between the phosphorus source and the root surface for this process. And then, I'm gonna just switch positions here, see if it helps. The uptake is affected by many soil, plant, and environmental factors, because that diffusion process is really, really sensitive to a whole bunch of different factors. So if we take a look at the system that's tying up and releasing the phosphate in our soils, and this is something that I was asked to speak of, if this reminds you of a Thursday morning agriculture diploma class lecture, don't worry, it's not gonna be 90 minutes of this. We're just gonna go over this briefly. There's three processes that tie up phosphorus in soil. One is immobilization. This is when microbes steal the plant nutrients for their own use. So you've put on phosphate fertilizer for uh, the crop, and if the microbes are short of phosphorus, in theory they could tie up that phosphorus for their own nutrition instead of for crop nutrition. But that happens very, very rarely. What often happens much in much greater uh, extent is precipitation occurs when the soluble phosphorus that you've applied, as any form of phosphate fertilizer basically, is reacting with like a calcium and magnesium in our high pH soils or with iron and aluminum in low pH soils, and it forms a precipitate. For example, in our calcium-rich soils in Manitoba, we see this compound called dical that forms, and it's a precipitate. It forms a solid that's no longer immediately available to the crop. That dical that forms with your fertilizer is the same as the dical in livestock mineral supplement. But another process is adsorption. This is where the phosphorus atoms individually, basically, get stuck on a soil surface. There are what we call adsorption sites in the soil surface, and the phosphorus can get stuck on that surface and is no longer easily available to the crop. Now, one of the benefits of our high organic matter soils here in Manitoba is that we have organic matter, whoopsie, We have organic matter that can coat some of these soil surfaces, and those organic matter molecules can be occupying sites that would otherwise tie up your phosphorus. So good high organic matter is good for phosphorus nutrition. So the release of the phosphorus is the opposite of these processes. You get dissolution of the precipitated material that forms when your fertilizer reacted with the calcium and magnesium in your soil during that growing season about 20% probably of the phosphate fertilizer that you applied will be released back to the plant roots through that process. You get some desorption from the surfaces and you also get mineralization as the microbes are now digesting richer food sources that have lots of phosphorus in them and they'll actually release some of that phosphorus that they tied up temporarily. But once again, these are biological and chemical processes that are affected by a lot of different factors, and it means that we see dramatic variability from one growing season to the next in how much phosphorus is actually released under field conditions. See if I can get this to move along. Some of the factors that are affecting it, soil pH is variable within a field, but a pH greater than seven, you've got lots of calcium magnesium tying up your soil, your soil phosphorus, and if pH is less than six, you get lots of iron and aluminum tying up the phosphorus. The soils are low in organic matter because um, in the organic matter is beneficial, as I mentioned before, in sort of covering some of those soil surfaces that would otherwise tie up your phosphorus and it also contains phosphorus. There's actual phosphorus in the organic matter that's released when the microbes are digesting that organic matter. It also uh, releases organic matter during the digestion 
of that organic matter and the decomposition processes, the microbes are respiring and they're breathing out carbon dioxide just like we do. The carbon dioxide first forms carbonic acid and that increases the solubility of some of those uh, precipitated phosphorus compounds. And then it, if our soils are cold, that restricts the release of, of phosphorus chemically. And on top of that, you actually have very poor root growth in the cold soil. So when we're planting our crops in the end of April or early May, that's a very difficult challenge to get adequate phosphorus nutrition. And that's why Stanley Barber, as uh, Edgar mentioned, showed very conclusively that early season phosphorus nutrition, absolutely critical in our prairie soils. Also, if you have low soil test P, whatever method you're using, you're probably going to run into problems with the release of phosphorus because the soil ha is hungry for phosphorus, has lots of retention capacity left to hold more phosphorus. So what we see is the northern Great Plains in general, the northern states as well as the western provinces, have a high proportion of soil samples that test low in P. Here in Manitoba, it's roughly 60%, but in Saskatchewan, 80% of the soil is testing low in P. North Dakota, 80% as well. This is some of the highest frequency of phosphorus deficiency in North America. So phosphorus is a key nutrient that we need to be concerned about it. And in fact, for the first um, probably 50 to 75 years of cultivating the soils in the prairies, phosphorus fertilizer was the number one uh, input for fertilizer before nitrogen. So if we take a look at the phosphorus deficiency uh, that uh, is detected in Agvise's uh, soil sampling program from this fall, you can see that even for 2023 here, we've got a very high uh, rate of phosphorus deficiency in Manitoba in that 50 to 60 percent range and in the southwest corner of the province, 72 percent of the samples testing low in phosphorus. Man, uh, Manitoba's deficiency is not as, frequency, uh, is not as frequent as, as Saskatchewan's. You can see that the frequency of phosphorus deficiency in Saskatchewan is even greater. So once again, phosphorus an, an important issue in prairie provinces. Here's an example of a phosphorus response. Um, this is a former student, Clayton Harder, who farms in the northeast, uh, northwest corner of Winnipeg, and he left a chest strip without 40 pounds of phosphate in his canola crop. Obviously, a big phosphorus response there. Another former student, Corey Elliott from Pipestone, um, he left a chest strip as well, and, a, and all the way through the growing season, he saw this uh, substantial P response. And so, uh, it's, it's, it's valuable to leave these check strips in the field and, and double check to see that we still are getting phosphorus responses because they don't always occur. It's a little inconsistent, but we do have a lot of phosphorus deficiency to be concerned about. So the right rate is the first part of the sort of 4R system that we have to look at. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the right rate. If we take a look at conventional soil testing, Oh boy, here. And we look at the soil fertility guide, for example, recommendations. They will have a table in the soil fertility guide that shows the soil test phosphorus level and then the matching uh, recommendation for the amount of phosphate fertilizer that should be applied for our various crops. And this is just a generalized sort of recommendation based on a, sort of a long-term accumulation of data and it's not meant to be uh, prescriptive to the point where we can guarantee that that's the optimum rate in the coming year because we don't know what the weather conditions are and some other factors that I'll talk about later. But in general, these are the recommendations that provide the best economic response uh, to phosphate without injuring your crop with seedling toxicity. But these recommendations are based on data like this. This data happens to be from Alberta Agriculture, uh, based on a modified Kelowna method of laboratory analysis. And scientists like me can go draw a line through these data points and get a response curve. But in reality, that response is highly variable across soils and years. 
So, yeah, I could show you a really nice, neat response curve, but if you look at the real data, there's a lot of variability there. And so we need to be realistic about the year-to-year -year variability and the other factors that are affecting P response and, um, and not try to pretend that we know exactly what's going to happen when that phosphate fertilizer is applied on your field for next year's crop. So what we've adopted in Manitoba is sort of a probability-based approach. What we're saying is within these data from all these experiments, we have soils that are testing low in phosphorus, and therefore there's a high probability of response. Soils that are testing high in phosphorus, in this case above like 20 or 30 part per million, that show a low probability of response, and then an intermediate zone here where about 50% of the soils are responding to phosphate. And that's, I think, a realistic way to portray phosphorus responses, and we see this being used more and more across North America because people are recognizing how variable the response to P is. So in Manitoba, our response curves, our, our, our recommendations are based on the concept that zero to five part per million Olson extractable P is very low, and based on this old data here, published in 1962, that's over 60 years ago, 100% of the trials with grass and wheat responded to fertilizer phosphate if they had less than 5 ppm. And at 12 to 18 ppm, it dropped down to only 50%, and over 18 p ppm, only a minority of soils showed a response with wheat and, and grasses. And you might say, well, why would you ever want to use data from that era? If we take a look at more recent numbers from trials across Western Canada, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba from 1988 to 95, so that's 25 to 30 years later, we actually have the same data for wheat across the three prairie provinces, less than 5 ppm, 100% of the sites responded, 10 to 20 part per million, 50% response, and at tw more than 20 part per million Olson extractable P, we've got only a 25% response. That's almost identical to the data that was gathered in the 1950s and early 60s. So we're pretty confident that this applies to wheat and other cereals. But we've got this challenge that the response to P varies under, with field conditions. Dr. Soper, when he was developing the phosphorus test in the 1950s, like almost 70 years ago, he got a really good relationship between P response and soil test P in the greenhouse. The soil test P explained 85% of the variability in P responses in his greenhouse tests. But when he went out into the field, the response was quite different. Oh dear. The, in the field, the same soil test with the same crops explained only 2% of the responses because there are so many factors that affect the response in one growing season compared to the next, or one field next to the next. And so I just want to go through some of those so that you have, a, I think, a realistic understanding of how well we can predict P response. So here's some, a graph that used to be published in the Guide to Farm Practice in Saskatchewan for many years. It's an 18-year experiment from 1950 to 1967 over here, and then it was extended with a little different uh, sort of uh, experimental method for another like 29 years in Saskatchewan. So there's roughly 47 years worth of data here on the same research plots. This is the same site, and this is P response at that site over this 47 year period. Variable as heck. Same soil test P level, basically, but year-to-year -year variation because of the balance between crop requirement and the soil's ability to supply being highly responsive to those environmental conditions. Crop species, and uh, I think Edgar mentioned this too, we take a look at soybeans and realize that that's a very aggressive crop for taking up soil P. Here's soybeans compared to canola and cereals. For uptake of fertilizer P, soybeans is not a standout. 
Here's the uptake of soil pea, showing that soybeans basically takes up twice as much phosphorus from the soil as our other crops. This work was done way back in the 1960s, but it explains why we see so few responses in soybean to that phosphate fertilizer. We jump ahead to a recent trial that we did with soybeans. We had 28 trials across Manitoba, and we had low soil test P in most of our sites. We got only one out of 28 site years where we had a P response, one response with zero to five part per million, where as we would normally expect with wheat, we'd see 100% of those sites responding to phosphate fertilizer. We had only actually one out of six and no responses in any of the other 27 sites. Soybeans is so aggressive at taking up soil phosphorus, it doesn't really need our fertilizer phosphorus. We've taken a look at corn responses to uh, starter P, and here's Magda Rogulski in her field trials near Carmen. And we had huge responses in the corn trials that she ran, more than twice the early season biomass with starter P, and a weak advancement in maturity for like tasseling, and um, a 10% increase in grain yield and a two to 3% drop in grain moisture. This was a very, very effective way uh, to grow corn. But it's interesting, after Magda's project, we had another graduate student that was working on the response to starter phosphorus for different corn hybrids. And Magda's hybrid was the one with the biggest response. And you look at these other hybrids, and even overall, though overall there was a P response to the starter phosphorus fertilizer, the response was far greater with the hybrid that Magda used than the other hybrids where there's very, very little response. So considering that the hybrids are changing every year, we have a very difficult time predicting phosphorus response under field conditions for different crop species and even different crop varieties or hybrids. Variability in the field. There was a question about variable rate. And here's um, a, a SWOT map from uh, Dwight Odeline, who farms near Quill Lake in Saskatchewan. And uh, if you take a look at the variation in phosphorus fertility across that field, in the high areas of the field, it was only eight part per million Olson P, which would be regarded as low. And in the low areas of the field, 45 part per million, which is double the level at which we would say it's very high plus. So extremely variable phosphorus supply. And the reason why he has such detailed information on this particular field is partly because the University of Saskatchewan is doing research to look at variable rate pea fertilization and its benefit for water quality. If we can keep the phosphate fertilizer out of these low areas, which are already high in phosphorus, that saves money for the farmer and it can reduce the phosphorus loss into the surface water that causes algae problems. So double benefit, agronomic and economic and environmental. So with all this variability, how should you apply phosphorus fertilizer? Well, uh, a colleague that has recently retired, John Hurd. John, are you here? Where is John? Over there. You have to say hi to John because uh, he doesn't get out much these days, um, but he uh, has been the architect of this uh, sort of uh, double, uh, sort of uh, two, two pathways uh, for, for recommending phosphate fertilizer. There's a short-term sufficiency standard, sort of sufficiency approach, where the rate is changed, is chosen based on the economic yield response in the year of application only. And this is typical for what we have in the Manitoba Soil Fertility Guide. It's usually modest rates of phosphate banded in or near the seed row, and at, at maybe 20, 30, 40 pounds per acre, that's usually your optimum economic return. And it's, short, it's suitable for short-term land tenure, like rented land, or if you're nearing retirement, an old guy like me, and when phosphorus costs are high relative to crop prices, like a couple of years ago.
this is where you've got to be very careful not to be over applying phosphate fertilizer because of the economic impact. But if you look at that rented and retirement element in there, we're calling this the 2R nutrient management strategy, sort of a half-assed 4R. And it's only for people that have a very short-term outlook or people that are in a short-term situation where crop prices relative to fertilizer prices aren't very favorable. So that approach is sort of embodied in the typical recommendations from the soil fertility guide. And once again, if we take a look at something like a 10 part per million soil test P level, and we look at the recommendation for soil, for applying the fertilizer P, you can see that these numbers here are fairly low, 30 pounds, 20 pounds, and 10 pounds, depending on what crop you're dealing with. So if we use those recommendations for short-term sufficiency for the maximum sort of economic return in the year of application, we're going to be putting on relatively modest rates. In our spring wheat, we might be putting on only 30 pounds of phosphate per acre, even though wheat could handle 50. We're putting only on only 30 because of the economics. Canola, 20 pounds in the seed row. Oats, 30 pounds in the seed row. Soybeans, only 10. And so you can see that in the year that we're growing canola and the year that we're growing soybeans, we're putting on a lot less phosphorus than what we're removing at a typical yield at harvest. And this is going to draw down our soil test P. Something like a, a 50 pound deficit of phosphate in that four year cycle is probably going to drop our soil test P by one or two part per million Olson P. And if you keep on doing that for a 10, 20 year period, uh, your P fertility is going to decline. Now this is a concern to us. We want to see some balance between phosphorus removal and phosphorus application because you can't spontaneously generate phosphorus from the air. You're going to have to apply it, either as like manure or as fertilizer or some source to balance those things off. Otherwise, your phosphorus fertility is on a one-way trip downward. Okay, so what we know from old work, this is work published in the 1980s, is that phosphorus responses in crops come from two sort of sources. One is the response to the phosphorus fertilizer in the year that it's applied and here that seed placed phosphorus fertilizer in the wheat crop. But it's also, crop is also responding to phosphorus fertility throughout the soil, the rooting soil zone. And this is uh, exemplified in this particular trial with the addition of 0, 80, and 160 pounds of phosphate applied prior to the beginning of the experiment. And you can see the yield is going up with the annual phosphorus application, but the yield also goes up with the background levels of soil fertility. So it's responding to the overall fertility as well as the annual application of phosphate fertilizer. So this is an important concept to recognize, and if you don't pay attention to it, you can see your phosphorus fertility declining to the point where you lose productivity, and the most dramatic example I've seen is at Canada's longest running organic farming systems trial at Glen Lee, the university through Dr. Martin Entz has a long-term organic trial, and this plot of alfalfa is split between the side that doesn't have any compost added and the side that had composted beef cattle manure applied. In that organic trial, after 13 years, even if they started off with very high soil pea fertility, it gradually declined to the point where the alfalfa couldn't even fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere for this organic crop rotation. And so people that are promoting organic agricultural systems and regenerative agriculture systems need to pay very close attention to this issue of replenishing the mineral nutrients. Yes, we can fix nitrogen, but we can't replace phosphorus by magic. Okay, so what about uh, taking a longer term sustainability approach? Well, this is going to um, require I guess a situation where you've got uh, a long-term tenure on your, on your land. Oh, come on. We aim 
our applications to maintain our soil test pea fertility, probably in the, somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 part per million. We don't have to go overboard and have super high pea fertility. We just want to get it into the medium uh, to high range. If we take a look at low pea soil then, that's testing under 10 part per million, we're probably going to build our pea fertility and we could use manure or extra applications of phosphate fertilizer in years where it's not very expensive. But also, if we've got more than 20 parts per million because the soil has a history of manure application, we can actually back off to those low rates just to get back to something like 10 to 20 parts per million. Long-term economics considers the residual p-value in this situation, and I'm going to show you some data from a real-life uh, on-farm trial that Adam Gurr uh, has been conducting for the last six years. But this is only suitable if you've got long-term land tenure. And this is something that's really important given the proportion of land that's rented nowadays. How much in uh, return on investment do you get if you've got like a year-to-year -year lease? I'm not sure I'd be too enthusiastic about that. Also, if your phosphorus fertilizer prices spike up, that's, that's not a, a situation that you, is really going to be uh, conducive to taking this long-term sustainability approach. But bottom line is, if your soil test is below 10, we're generally going to be recommending to uh, increase your soil test P level by applying more phosphate than the crop is removing. If you're in that 10 to 20 pp ppm sweet spot, we think that you can probably balance your inputs with crop removal. Keep on monitoring with annual soil testing. But if you're above 20, you can draw down by using that starter P low rate and not worrying about having a short-term deficit because you've got so much in your savings account, you can afford to run a deficit. So once again, this concept is based on, on the, the knowledge of crops responding to both soil P fertility and uh, at annual additions of P. And so here's an example of a six-year trial north of Brandon conducted by Adam Gerd. Adam, is Adam here perchance? Maybe not. Adam put on a high rate of P on different parts of this field, and he replicated his trials multiple times so he could do the statistical analysis. He put the phosphate on at, whoops, at the beginning of 2018, and it's got six crops, and you can see that he's growing really excellent yields of wheat and canola in these years. Uh, some of these years, maybe not such great a crop. We had, I think, some problems with, he had some problems with uh, verticillium in this year. And the soybeans aren't going to respond to phosphorus fertilizer. We know that. But we take a look in particular at the wheat uh, responses in this six years. We see big responses to that extra phosphate fertilizer that was applied back in 2018. And this is in addition to the 35 pounds of phosphate that he applies side-banded at planting every year. So this is the response to the background levels of pea fertility, and it's still showing benefits six years later. And when he did the economic analysis a couple of, uh, or last year, he looked at gross returns over the five-year period at that time and looked at the cost for that, and he was finding benefits to having 175 pounds of extra phosphate applied across the whole field or 350 pounds of phosphate, extra phosphate applied to the whole field, deep banded, so it's not going to wash off the soil. And in fact, the best treatment in his suite of treatments was a variable rate averaging 135 pounds of phosphate, the lowest rate of supplemental P, but carefully selected to be applied primarily in those elevated portions of the landscape where the phosphorus soil tests were lowest and avoiding extra phosphate in the lower areas of the landscape where the phosphorus supply was rich. Another thing to notice in these data is that the soil test level at the end of the, 
of, of, of three years, and so in 2021, had increased in the supplemental treatments. And if you take a look at the surplus P that was required to raise soil tests by one part per million, it's about 30 or 40 pounds of extra phosphate to raise the soil test P level by one part per million. This is very similar to the results of an experiment that Cindy Grant and I conducted several years ago across locations in Western Canada. And we looked at applications of soil, of, of fertilizer phosphate at low, medium, and high rates and then tracked the change in the soil test P over that period. We had two sites near Brandon run at the Brandon Research Station and one at the Phillips Farm just uh, north and, and east of, of Forest. And it took about 30 to 40 pounds of phosphate surplus to increase our soil test P level by one part per million. So it's not cheap to increase your soil test P level, but at least in Adam's trial, which was statistically analyzed and very precisely conducted, he saw economic benefits to deep banding some extra P, especially in those poor fertility areas in the upper uh, part of the landscape. So let's take a look at how a person might be able to employ that strategy of a long-term sort of sustainable pea management strategy. And I've outlined here the results of what might happen to address this issue here, where let's say you had a four-year rotation of spring wheat, canola, oats, and soybeans, and you've got this deficit showing up at the end of the four-year cycle with 50 pounds less phosphate in your soil than what you started off with. So what can be done to address that issue? Well, you can apply sufficient P year by year in a sideband or mid-row band to maintain P fertility, and we're actually seeing some landowners require this, that renters maintain the P fertility of their fields by demonstrating that they've applied phosphorus at the rate of crop removal. You can also use a rotational fertilization strategy for P. You don't have to put on a lot of P every year. You can put on more P in some years when the crops are most responsive and also when it's safest to apply P. So you can apply extra P in the crops that tolerate high rates of seed place P. So you can put on 50 pounds an acre of phosphate, like 100 pounds of 1152 per acre, in the seed row with wheat and other cereals. Cereals are very tolerant to that seed row P. That gives you a little bit of extra P that year to compensate for maybe the canola crop next year that you don't uh, want to apply that much P. Livestock manure application applied to meet crop end requirements has more P in it than the crop is going to remove, and that can nur nurture your crops for the next like three, four, five years, no problem. But we want to avoid situations where people are just taking the easiest way to apply that phosphorus, just broadcasting high rates, let's say in the fall, because runoff losses are high from this application method. If you broadcast something like 1152, experimental data from the US shows you might lose 50 times more phosphorus in the surface water runoff from that method of application. And we don't want to invite the regulators to um, start uh, impinging our ability to apply fertilizer, so that's not something I would recommend. So here's how those work out. If we follow the soil fertility guide recommendations for seed row phosphorus, once again, we have a deficit of 50 pounds of phosphate less at the end of our rotation than what we had at the beginning. If you can put it on with side banding or mid-row banding, you can pretty much balance it off exactly every year because you don't have to worry about the seed row safety. If you put on the maximum amount of seed row P in the cereal years, like 50 pounds an acre, you can have a little bit of a surplus in those cereal years to compensate for the deficit in your oil seed years. And of course, if you apply nitrogen, pr uh, apply fer uh, manure at a rate to supply the crop's nitrogen requirements, you can see a big surplus in that first year when the manure is applied, and you can draw that down during the next three years. So that's a really a convenient way. If you've got uh, manure for yourself or, or access to manure from a neighbor, that can be a, a, very way, a very good way to maintain your pea fertility.
So the long-term sustainability and short-term sufficiency strategies are for farmers like you folks to decide, uh, depending on your land tenure and, and sort of where you're at with, the, with your, your pea fertility. But we're going to see that acknowledged in the new version of the Soil Fertility Guide. We're going to get more upfront about this long-term sustainability approach. And it's something that's, I think, very important for people that have the, the land tenure to, uh, to look forward to. So what about sources of P? If we take a look at sources of P, we're pretty um, conventional in our recommendations here. The uh, sources of P that we recommend, traditional good old fashioned monomonium phosphate or 1152, is a very, very efficient fertilizer. And it was well uh, researched in the early part of the 20th century that showed that it was superior to a bunch of the other fertilizers used in other parts of the world. And in fact, it's becoming more and more popular around the world. It certainly performs better than the calcium phosphate used in the United States and the UK. It can also uh, outperform uh, diammonium phosphate, a US fertilizer, 1846, which is too hard on the seed we don't want to see uh, that diammonium phosphate in the seed row, that's why we don't see it. But one of the key factors that's making the monoammonium phosphate such a good fertilizer is when the plant takes up ammonium, it excretes uh, hydrogen, and it acidifies the reaction zone next to the root, which improves the solubility of the phosphate fertilizer. It's an excellent uh, sort of way of enhancing pea uptake efficiency. So we see our most popular fertilizers always have ammonium. Monoammonium phosphate, ammonium polyphosphate. Ammonium helps phosphorus to be taken up. So ammonium polyphosphate, a reasonably popular form of liquid fertilizer. But, and the final uh, product out of the plant here, for example, in the coke plant here in Brandon, contains different lengths of phosphorus chains. The chains of phosphorus are created to increase the P content in the manure so they can get, I mean the fertilizer, so they can get 34% phosphate instead of a very low analysis. And the good thing about soil biology is that there are these plant and soil enzymes that uh, break up those chains of phosphate and within a few hours or days of application, the polyphosphate is converted into plant available ortho P. So you don't really have to invest in a low analysis, more expensive form of ortho P. The polyphosphate breaks down into ortho P naturally in the soil. So there's another fertilizer crystal green that's on the market, and I like this fertilizer because it's recycled phosphorus from wastewater, from sewage, basically. But it's chemically reacted, so you don't have to worry about potentially toxic elements or biohazards or anything else like that. And it's a form of ammonium magnesium phosphate. It's the same compound in kidney stones. And I won't ask who here has kidney stone problems, but this makes it a natural product we're hoping to get it approved for organic farming here, like it is already approved for organic farming in Europe. But it's a vital step towards sustainable recycling of phosphorus back from where food is consumed into the areas where food is produced. Okay, moving on to the overall debate about fluid versus dry fertilizers. There's been some research in Australia conducted by friends of ours which shows improvements in phosphorus use efficiency by using liquid compared to granular fertilizers. And there's reasons for that, which I'm not gonna get into, but this is really good research for their conditions where they've got 70% carbonates in some of their soils. But we've done, or I shouldn't say we've, Cindy Grant and Geza Rax, other people have done research on these types of fertilizers here in Manitoba have not been able to see the same results under our conditions. And it may be because, it be because our soils have less carbonate in them, or it might be because we have more moisture in the spring when the phosphorus is reacting with the soil, but we don't get the same results. And just an example of this is some research from Cindy Grant's trials near Brandon here, 
where she looked at ammonium polyph polyphosphate in a band compared to 1152 or monoammonium phosphate in a band, and she found similar P responses in a clay loam soil and a silty clay soil, no differences. So whether you want to use ammonium polyphosphate 1034 or monoammonium phosphate 1152, similar results in these trials. So just be sure that the cost of your phosphate fertilizer per pound of phosphate is affordable for building or maintaining your pea fertility. This is a very, very important statement. That's why it's in that caution sign. A friend of mine switched to a low P application system 20 years ago, and it was costing him quite a bit per pound of phosphorus, but it was very safe for seed row application. But he was putting on a rate that was low because it was pretty expensive stuff. And after 10 years of doing that, his soil test P just kept going down and down and down. And 10 years later, I met him at a conference like this. And he says, Don, he says, I should have listened to you. He says, this is very difficult for me to admit. Sometimes I've even had to say this to my wife, but you were right and I was wrong. He said, my, our phosphate fertility was obviously declining and we've gone back to using a cheaper form of phosphate, but making sure that we apply it at the rate of crop removal so we can maintain our pea fertility. So that's just, uh, I think, a, a pretty logical uh, story about the need to pick an affordable phosphate source. Okay, what about placement and timing? We're pretty firm on this, wanting to recommend banded phosphate placed in or near the seed row. Here's hoping for the next slide. Agronomically beneficial because the phosphorus is needed very early in growth, which is what we heard earlier. It was a very Im Im important discovery in the 1940s. Phosphorus does not move very far in the soil, so you've got to be careful where it's placed, and we like it in or near the seed row for that reason. And it needs to be accessible by the plant early in the season when the cold soils are restricting pea movement as well as, in particular, root growth. So people are in other parts of the world just can't believe that we're planting crops when the subsoil is still frozen. Like, that's what's happening when we're planting our crops at the end of April, early May, subsoil is still frozen. Other people in other parts of the world just go, huh? Like, are you guys nuts? But we, we need to do that in order to capitalize on that early growing season. So it's environmentally beneficial as well. Our phosphorus is placed under the soil surface after spring runoff. This is the most environmentally safe way to apply our phosphate with the least risk that it's going to run off with snow melt, for example. So this is, this is really good agronomically, economically, environmentally, sort of a, a, a really excellent way to apply. And so this is long-term historical data, but it's still the truth. If we take a look at these old data from the Western Co-op Fertilizers Training Manual in long-term trials across Western Canada, their grain yield increase from 18 pounds banded with the seed was equivalent to 72 pounds an acre broadcast. So in terms of economic return on investment, banded pea in or near the seed row may be e easily two to four times more effective than broadcast pea. And we also see benefits in this historical study from the 1980s Benefits from that seed place P, even though our P fertility was increased overall with the broadcast P, we still need that P in or near the seed row for starter phosphorus early in the growing season when the soils are cold. Being careful though not to over apply P in the seed row because it can damage seedlings. Here's canola palooza. Portage La Prairie in 2016. I don't know how many of you saw this trial, but this is only 20 pounds of P205 per acre. That's like 40 pounds of 1152 per acre with disc openers at 12 inch spacing and it's burnt the crop. And considering how expensive canola seed is now, 
This is something you don't want to happen in your field. So it's important to respect the seed row toxicity issue. And Amy Delaki talked about this and, and Chris Holds Affel on Monday. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very important issue to keep track of. Despite canola having these huge requirements for phosphate with its higher yield potential these days, we still have to be very careful with our seed row rates. So once again, in terms of a bottom line for the recommended application of phosphorus, it's summarized in this um, review here that's available online. But high prices for our fertilizers and our crops have increased the risks of either overapplying or underapplying our fertilizer. And it's important to apply our nutrients very efficiently to maintain a healthy bottom line. Our high prices for fertilizer and crops have increased the rewards from efficient application. That's a positive spin on it rather than a negative one. And if we take a look at rates of phosphate, for long-term pea fertility maintenance, you're going to have to apply pea at rates equal to crop, crop removal. And there's no way around this issue. There's no spontaneous generation of phosphorus in place, and there's no atmospheric deposition of any consequence. In terms of source, use an ammonium phosphate fertilizer that's affordable so that you can maintain your pea fertility. Low rates of high efficiency fertilizers are going to deplete your fertility over time. Look at placement and timing. Banding pea in or near the seed row, once again, two to four times more efficient than broadcast pea. So pretty traditional sort of message there, but we have data to sort of back up this approach. And once again, I just want to um, pay tribute to Dr. Cindy Grant, who's the co-author of this uh, review that's available online. And also want to acknowledge John Hurd's uh, help with all this. Uh, he's been, he and Cindy have just been fantastic partners and colleagues and teammates um, during my career. And I, and I want to acknowledge their contributions to this presentation. Dave, if we've got a few minutes for questions. Anybody have some questions? Okay. Shout it out. Yep. Okay, two questions, and they're very good questions about heavy clay soils near Winnipeg. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. <laughs> heavy clay soils will require more pounds of phosphate to raise their pea fertility by one part per million. That's what uh, showed up in that study that I mentioned for Cindy Grant. We didn't work with a heavy clay soil, but we worked with a high pH clay loam, and it required 30 to 50 pounds. My guess is that a heavy clay soil might require 40 to 50. That's just a wild-ass guess. But you also mentioned about adding some other compounds with the phosphate fertilizer to improve their availability. And sulfate does improve availability of phosphate for the short term, at least. We've got data from the lab to show that. But I don't think we've got data from the field to show the practical value of it. But there would be two advantages. One is that the ammonium sulfate would acidify that reaction zone. But the other thing is that the sulfate itself competes with phosphorus for tie-up by the calcium and magnesium. And so the same chemical agents, calcium and magnesium, that are tying up phosphate tie up sulfate to some extent, and if you can distract the calcium and magnesium with the sulfate, you might have more phosphate available. But I would say that most of those reactions are going to be most beneficial in a short term rather than the long term. In the long term, it's pretty much pounds of phosphate fertilizer per acre. But good question. Is it true that uh, sulfur is can the act as a safener for phosphate for root damage? Okay, the question is, does sulfur fertilizer act as a safener By adding it. to phosphate fertilizer seed row safety? No. Um, it's kind of tricky. Okay, 
we, 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 we have data from Saskatchewan and Manitoba that clearly demonstrates that adding a soluble form of sulfate fertilizer increases seed row toxicity. Doesn't decrease it. But there are certain types of fertilizer which have combined sulfur with phosphate that use elemental S instead of sulfate. And because elemental S is basically inert in soil and doesn't have salt stress or nitrogen stress associated with it, it's a safer form of sulfur to apply than ammonium sulfate. But it's not as effective in the year of application either. So there's trade-offs there. It's not a simple situation where adding sulfur is going to benefit your seed row safety. But elemental sulfur is safer than ammonium sulfate, but it doesn't perform as well either, so there's a trade-off. Yep. Yeah, the, the question was, okay, what about an alternative to building your pea with, let's say, a fall application subsurface? Like a, a band application would be ideal, but you might have a sweep on it or something like that. I think, I think that that is probably the most practical way of applying extra phosphate in a situation where your seeding implement limits you because you don't have side banding or mid-row banding capacity at seeding. If you've got an air drill that gives you that mid-row and side banding capability, I still think that that's an excellent way to apply it. But as an alternative, putting some plastic pipe on your deep tiller and subsurface banding your uh, phosphorus, extra phosphorus fertilizer as well as perhaps your ammonium sulfate. I, I, I'm really concerned about ammonium sulfate toxicity in the seed row of canola. I heard somebody mention canola seed prices the other day per bag, and I was just shocked. And I'm thinking like, I don't want that canola in contact with ammonium sulfate. And ammonium sulfate doesn't require seed row placement like phosphate does. I would be re reserving the seed row fertilizer rate for phosphate only, if I possibly could. So I think that your approach makes sense. And there are farmers that are converting their deep tillers over to uh, apply fertilizer. That way they can use their air tank, but they don't have to use their air drill uh, for rattling over those acres in the fall. Yep. Well, okay, this business of placing the phosphate four inches down so it's in moisture all season long is actually not quite as true as some people think. A long time ago, summer of 1981, I measured soil moisture at various depths in the soil because I was working on deep banded pea for my PhD thesis. And I made a very important discovery. This might shock you, but rain falls from the sky and then it comes into the soil and it filters down from the top of the soil into the root zone. And in my measurements, I often found that the surface of the soil was wetter than the four inch depth. It's not a universal rule. Now in areas like Australia, their deep placement of phosphorus works really well because they start off with moisture after the wet season, then it goes dry and it stays dry. So they just get continuous evaporation and transpiration, drawing the moisture out of that surface forever. We don't have the same thing because we have periodic rains. So if you had a year that was like a summer in Australia, that deep placement might work. If you had a year that was typical for, let's say, eastern Manitoba, then with more frequent rainfall, that might not work at all. And Maurice Bourgault, an agronomist at the University of Saskatchewan, is experimenting with that deep banding concept to try and look at those sorts of issues. And she may find completely different results in Saskatchewan than what I found 43 years ago.